Blog Talk Radio. Yeah, that's enough of that. Welcome to Desperate House Witches. <laughs> I'm Raina Starks, and you don't have to be. Desperate House Witches is, a, is not a G, PG, or even an R-rated show, so bad language, bodily function, dirty talk of any kind might offend you. This is not the show for you. But that's why you tuned in, and we all know it. Desperate House Witches is brought to you by the incredibly wicked one, the amazing Dorothy Morrison. Please check out www.dorothymorrison.com for all of your Dorothy Morrison needs. And if you are looking for Wicked Witch Mojo products, please consult your local witchy retailer, and they should be able to help you get those products. Anyway, again, that's www.dorothymorrison.com. Uh, oh, Jesus, I just forgot the name of her book that got re-released. Bud, Blossom, and Bloom um, has been re-released with a beautiful new cover. Um, so go get yourself a copy of that. As always, I continue to recommend Utterly Wicked, one of the best, best hexing books I've ever read in my entire life. Um, also, as a reminder... I will be at the Mystic South Conference. It is only weeks away. It is July 26th through the 28th. We're going to have all kinds of amazing presenters. We're going to have all kinds of fun guests. Um, I'm doing two shows this year, one on the night before the conference starts and the first night of the conference. Please get your tickets. It is Mystic South conference.com. I think there's a slash in there somewhere. But anyway, you will see the dates are the are July 26th through the 28th. We will be at the beautiful uh, uh, that that What the hell is in that? Oh yes, the Plaza Perimeter at Ravinia in beautiful Atlanta, Georgia. It's going to be so much fun. And the organizers have planned a gaming. A situation for gamers, it, it, it's just going to be absolutely out of sight. So you're going to want to get a schedule. You're going to go, going to want to get your tickets ready. And if you're coming from out of town, you're going to want to get yourself a hotel room. Don't waste time. I'm just saying. All your Llewellyn favorites will be there. Your Moonbrook favorites will be there. Some Red Wheel Wiser favorites will be there. I'm just saying show up at the party and come and give me a hug because I could use one. It's been a rough year. All right, enough of that. With me today for the hour is the amazing, wonderful, and very sweet friend of mine named Jamie Elford, who is a tarot Aww. person. And you Aww. know I love my tarot people. Hi, my darling. How well, are you? I'm doing well. Thank you for uh, an amazing welcome and introduction. <laughs> of course, of course. It's, so, it's, it's always fun, fun to come back. back. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm, I'm, and I'm always glad to have you. So it's been a while. It's probably been about a year since the last time we spoke, right? So yes, yes, it what's has. Been going on. Yeah. So what's been oh, going goodness. on in your life since the last time we spoke? Yeah, I want to hear all the details, honey. Well, <clears throat> I've been just kind of plugging away at my own um, stuff, not really publishing anything. I've been working on the Carter Mancer magazine, which won a Silver Cover Award a couple of weeks ago for what we do. So big shout out to the owner and my my primary editor, Amber Highland, and our graphic designer, Wiz, uh, Safira Stone, because without those ladies, it'd be kind of weird editing stuff and not getting it put out there. But so we've been having a lot of fun with the magazine. This year we released a tribute, a special tribute that is open to the public. So you don't need to have a, um, a subscription to get to it. For a $5 donation, you can download the PDF. It only comes in a PDF copy of a, of a Rachel Pull-Up tribute where it's got some of uh, Tarot's biggest voices and a few other people that have written some very beautiful tribute pieces along with photographs of her book covers and some other stuff that we've dug up from the interwebs and stuff. So all the some of the money will go to help the Rachel Pollock Estate Fund. So some cool stuff that's going on around that. That's awesome. 
That is awesome. Thank you. What else has been going on with you? Well, let's see here. In October of last year, I got a call that I never expected I'd be getting. So Mary Kay Greer called me up and asked me to teach in this this summer's in August from 9th to 11th Masters of Teachers Conference, which is held at the Omega Institute for Holistic Studies in Rhinebeck, New York. Ooh, I'm intrigued. Tell me more. You got it. So basically, the Masters of Omega um, weekend kind of it's a retreat slash conference, but you only have four teachers. So it's going to well, it used to be five when Rachel was teaching alongside Mary, and they would invite three yeah. different masters. And so this year it's going to be me alongside Nancy Antonucci, aka the Nooch, and Michelle Welch. Oh, no. So we're all. Yeah, the oh, news. Wow. I'm so excited to be with Nooch. I love that's awesome. Oh God, yeah, we we have so much fun when we chat all you know together and stuff. So we're gonna go to Omega, and we're gonna each one of us has like a two two and a half hour long presentation that we give on a particular topic. Now I don't know what Nancy's gonna do, and I'm not sure what Michelle's gonna do, but I can give people um, a little sneak peek into what I'm going to do which is, uh, to me, tarot is world building. So I come from a background of heavily writing. If you've read my book, Tarot Inspired Life, I donate or I have two chapters on writing techniques. One is more journaling focused. The other one is like yeah. writing stories, actual characters, worlds, and plots for you to use your cards more often than just divination tools which was huge mm -hmm. for me when I was working on that book. I had people that would tell me, you're not supposed to use the cards more than once a day if you're reading for right. yourself, you know. Yeah, yeah that was my question. Understand. Why? Yeah, I don't get the rules. I don't understand. Yeah, I don't either. Or like, you know, well, I, I kind of understand the rule of no touchy, you know, not having people touch your yeah. decks in today's day and age. However, there's all these weird little rules, and I kind of demystify some of those in the beginning of the book. But for me, after reading Terror for Yourself by Mary Kay Creer, I was like, I want to do all the things with my cards. I'm going to break all those rules. And that's what my book was geared towards. So for me, at its core, at, its, at, at my core is an author. I create stories. And, and I also fell um, in college in with a crowd that played a lot of D&D games. So, again, that idea of creating story, of world building. And then at some point I wanted to try and blend the two together. Well, my class is going to be based on uh, world building. So, to me, tarot is world building. When we use the cards to divine messages, either for ourselves or for others, those are stories. We lay down three cards, you get a beginning, middle, and end past, present, future, situation, maybe one step to do, and an outcome. So all these things go into that story. So when you use your deck, these messages slash stories get colored by what world you see in each card's image. Now, I've written over 20 little white booklets, in some, in some cases a couple of big books, for decks. And... It's always interesting to see the images and how they want to speak. Some of them tell stories. Like um, one of my favorite projects I worked on was Tarot Z, a truly more gruesome style of uh, a zombie in tarot. And it was my, I, I call it my zombie deck because I wanted that blood. I wanted that visceral stuff. And when I was writing that, I created small snippet stories of a zombie apocalypse to go along with those wonderful cards. And it worked. So, it, you know, you get maybe like the moon card who has this human-looking person. And I say human-looking person because I couldn't tell if she was an undead or not. Standing on a pile of bones and rubble with zombies coming up, and yet she's playing a violin. And you could just hear some music. So I think I wrote a poem for that. But it's like if you were in a zombie apocalypse, and how some people would hand you a weapon or some armor or a first aid kit 
the military hands you a tarot deck and says, read this. I don't know why, but A, it helps. It'll tell you everything you need to know. And B, using it will save your life. And the juxtaposition of all that really is was so much fun. So sometimes the decks that we buy, like that zombie deck, or any of the steampunk tarots, or even some of the fantasy tarots that you get out there are story-driven decks where you it brings to mind like, oh, the bad guy might be this alchemist who's trying to convert people. Or, you know, vampire decks where you've got, you know, the vampires in the shadows trying to bite the humans. So your and then, you know, after all this, your brain and your experience layer upon these images to create a singular, unique worldview, which is why I like to tell people if you're gonna if you're going to like a psychic fair, tell yeah. that same question to as many readers as you can afford because you'll get Similar information, and yet you'll get that unique worldview from each of the people that you're talking to. You might get a practical suggestion. You might get a more intuitive insight behind what's going on around your question, or even a spell or some other interesting tidbit, like tea weave readers. You know, you get an experience around drinking tea and then having them divine what that cup actually has inside for you. So we bring all this to the table when we do our readings or when we stare at a new deck, and then we apply the meanings to match those questions that we ask. So in my class, I'm going to peel back the curtain just a little bit to share with you some of the ways. So I'm going to teach my students how they can engage with the worlds inside the cards. Now, the idea of a Masters of Tarot class might put some of our listeners or some people hearing this, they might be, well, I'm a beginner, Jamie. I, I don't know if the Masters program or retreat is for me, and I say, pa, it is. It takes all <laughs> levels, and especially in my classes, I take all levels because you don't have to memorize meetings. You don't have to, you know, grab books, even mine, even though I would like people to buy my book, Carol Inspired Life by Llewellyn Worldwide. I, you know, I look at the cards as a complete story unit in itself, and so beginners will take away new ways to engage with their cards, see a story through the whole deck, maybe even begin to write that story. Intermediate people that look at, like, maybe what I've done over the past, oh God, has it been almost 20 years of writing mm -hmm. little white books <laughs> for other people's tarot decks. And they can, yeah. you know, learn from my mistakes or my triumphs into engaging with art and putting it out for a public appearance. And then finally, people, masters, you know, and I say everybody's got at least one deck in them. This way can also be used to create your own deck, whether you have an artist friend doing it for you or you're doing it yourself. And I really do honestly believe that everybody has at least one tarot deck that they can birth to the world. So this practice combines the art of world building in a way to understand yeah. tarot and gives you that a way to develop those connections to each deck and everybody's collection. So I'm excited to do this. And I've been putting teasers out on Facebook, and I'll be putting uh -huh. out a secondary teaser next week. So the first teaser had the image of the Winnie the Pooh tarot in a tin, the mini, because I like mini decks, with a I bunch of dice. Oh. And the second teaser is going to have another idea of what exactly I'm going to be doing. So while I've given you all this, you know, word verbiage, what is actually going to happen is going to be quite different. And I'm super excited, but I have to keep it a secret just for a little bit longer. However, oh, okay. again, yeah, again, it's going on August 9th through 11th, 2024. So this August 9th www.eomega.org is how you find it. You just type in Masters of Tarot or type in Tarot, and you can even type my name in, and that will pull up the page for where I'm going to teach. And it's in Rhinebeck, New York, which for this West Coast gal, I'm going to be flying red-eye, getting there on Friday, driving down, and then leaving kind of just as quickly. But the week before, Mary and Carolyn Cushing and Terry Isacuso are going to uh, do a week-long kind of boot camp 
called Wisdom of Tarot, and that is going to ease truer beginners into ways to engage with the cards differently than the Masters of Tarot. So you can make it an entire week and a half long trip out to Rhinebeck and be able to learn from people like me, like Nooch, Mary, Carolyn Cushing is amazing. I took, um, I did a Zoom with her just on Wednesday through her um, Shining Tribe, uh, Shining Woman group study. And I got so many cool insights out of that. It's, it's amazing. So it doesn't matter if you're brand new or an expert. Tarot is that lifelong learning thing. And the um, Omega Institute for Holistic Studies is such a wonderful place. It's basically an adult summer camp where it's they don't just host pagany things. They don't just host tarot things. They host to a huge world of ho- holistic uh, people, it's spirituality, psychology. Last year, I went to the Omega Institute for the first time as a student. Uh-huh. I stayed in a dorm room. I had access to food. They, they um, In the tuition, you get access to a vegan, all-you-can-eat kind of buffet-style breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And it was wonderful. They do have a cafe where you can buy burgers or chicken or some of the um, other higher protein type stuff, but it's this fun, open kind of at- atmosphere where you could come in, you can stay in, a, you can rent a cabin or do what I did, rent a dorm room, learn, and then you at the meal times you sit with so many other people that may or may not be in your Masters of Tarot section or others, and like I think there was a tapping group there or some other oh, wow. style of psychology going on. And I remember me and a few others were like, wow, that's cool. I want to take that class. I wish, you know, we, you know, you can do both of them. So it's a really neat environment and campus set up for people of all ages and, and of all walks of life. So I highly recommend, you know, going or trying to experience the Omega Institute if you can. So that's kind of been eating up most of my time this past year and this year, and I've been, um, I'm pulling all the, the DAP, the DRAP, the DETRIS, the DAP from my um, presentation, and I'm going to soon kind of do some testing with it so I can put some people through it just to make sure it's going to work okay and people are going to understand it. Cool. So I got to ask, yeah. because obviously mm-hmm. Mary Greer is a, Mary Kay Greer is a big name in our industry, yes. as it were. Um, <laughs> uh, sometimes the verbiage makes me a little nuts, but you know, so you had mentioned before we went on the air that it wasn't necessarily a call that you had been expecting. Were you friends with Mary before this? Yeah, yeah. So one of the really cool things I love about our terror community, especially with um, the various festivals or like Mystic South, where everybody's so approachable. Yeah. And just, you know, happy. And I've done, um, I've attended PantheaCon back in the day. I've mm-hmm. attended the Bay Area yeah. Tarot Symposium, a.k.a. BATS, and, you know, the Reader Studio, and, of course, here in the Pac Northwest, and it's coming up this October, and I'm attending that. It's the uh, Northwest Tarot Symposium. But it's, you know, you you learn along the big names. Like, I've, I've taught, cl- I've taken classes from Mary, I've taken classes mm-hmm. from Rachel Pollock. But when they're not teaching, they sit with you and you learn together or you have these amazing conversations. So Mary and I developed kind of a friendship. And, like, I, one one year at Pantheacon, it was like she was stalking me where she, everywhere mm-hmm. I turned, she was right there waving at me, calling my name out. And at one point, I heard the disembodied voice of Mary, but I didn't see her because I'm deaf in my right ear, so I'm, like, looking around, and Mary's like, I'm over here. Finally, I spotted her, and we totally joked about that, how it was like, I thought Mary Greer was a stalker this year, you know, because we were just kind of, like, running around kind of in circles around each other. And But it was a huge honor to be asked for this because I do hold Mary and, like, Nooch, and Michelle in a high esteem. And sometimes I'm like, people, number one, probably think I'm younger than I am. I'm going to be turning 50 
and I'm going to be turning 50 over um, Omega, so on August 10th, that is my 50th birthday. And people probably mm-hmm. sometimes, you know, don't think I'm that old, and yet I am. And But with some of my knowledge, it's hard for me to place into words, so I'm, I don't feel like I'm up there, like, you know, like the others oh. with the ability to do these mass, cool presentations, like Annabelle Wen, like she – blew us away last year with this reading that tied uh, neuroscience, the, the research she did in that, with tarot, and then, of course, her upcoming book, The I Ching, and it just pff, blew me away, and I just, I wish she, if you're listening, Belle, you need to write that book. You can do it, and it was amazing. I guess, so, you know. I got it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I find her so intimidating. <laughs> oh, she's she's yeah, but she's amazing. It's like taking Mary and Rachel and putting it together in a in a um, younger package, kind of so to speak, because she does all this yeah. research, like like Rachel had done. And but the way she applies it and experiences it is just so applicable. And that's kind of how I see Mary, you know, is doing. And she's I don't know I I've known Belle many many years now, and she's. Oh, I don't know. Maybe it's because I, I've known her for that long or something that she's always been approachable to me. But, you know, she's yeah, great, I mean, and I love that. It, yeah, it's nothing she's ever done that makes me feel intimidated because she seems mm-hmm. lovely. It's just her brain power scares the shit out of me. Okay, yeah, no. I, I have this thing where I have a couple of friends, Benabelle included, where I wish I could, like, I don't know, take their sweat or essence or something, put a couple of drops in a bottle and drink it, you know, and get some of that genius or something. And I know that sounds weird and maybe kind of creepy. I, honestly, folks, I'm not that creepy, I promise. But it's it's amazing <laughs> to watch, you know, your friends that are these, have these wonderful skill sets and how they share and what they do with it. And, you know, it's it's, I don't know. It's also kind of like the mutual admiration society because I know on um, you know on the other end they're probably doing things that I'm doing now you know about me so it's it's wonderful and a lot of fun. I do have to give a shout out to Michelle Welch. Um, I'm I'm so ecstatic when I heard that uh, the Reader Studio was going to be taken over. Um, I was a bit sad because the Amber especially Ruthann Amberstone, I've known since I was, quite frankly, a teenager. Um, and just, I'm, I'm so appreciative that that legacy is going to continue uh, with yeah. Michelle Welch. I just think yeah. that's so cool, and I just want to pub- publicly say thank you for doing that. I hope to get there sometime, but um, oh, it's just, you it's, know, the reader... The Reader Studio has such an institution for such a long time. I think the community would be sorely lacking without it. So I, I'm just so glad that it's been a continuum. That, that to me is such a relief for future well, roles of old hats. <laughs> well, it doesn't matter if you're new hat or old hat. The Reader Studio is an amazing place. Like, um, I didn't go this year because I've been working on the Omega stuff. And um, I had, you know, other personal things going on. But um, yeah. it's, it's, it's a family reunion to me. And I'm hoping to go back next year. And from what I hear, you know, this year was, a, was fantastic. They got a lot of cool people presenting for both Divination Day as well as the three master classes that they do. So um, it's, it's also differently formatted. Like most of the pagans – that go to festivals or these gatherings like Mystic South or how Pantheacon used to be is kind of more symposium style or like university style where you go and you have this huge menu of classes that you're like, how am I supposed to pick? I don't want to pick. But in Reader Studio, they have everybody learning at the same time. So you learn from three master classes that are you know, even longer than Omega's classes, and it's just, it's so cool. And then again, those masters sit in the audience with you, and you, you know, get to watch them and learn with them as well. So, yeah, yeah, and I am glad that it's going to continue. Yeah. Yeah. I think everybody needs to go. Definitely, definitely. 
least a million times. <laughs> I've not been once yeah. to the Reader's Studio, but I do want to go. And, of course, you know, the Tarot School has been around for a very long time. And mm-hmm. I, I I just think it's a, they do a lot over there as well. Um, but, you know, I wanted to ask you a question about being the person behind the little book, <laughs> the yeah. little white book. Go for it. How, how does that – see, my vision of somebody creating a deck is that the person has ideas for images. They may not be the artist, but they have ideas for images, and they have an idea for what the book – they would like the book to say. So I, I'm, I was a little surprised when you said you have written – uh, more than a couple of these books for other folks. How does that come yeah. about? All righty. Well, I'm not sure who exactly, but I remember um, I, I, this is mostly through the company Los Garabero, which is distributed by Llewellyn. And one right. day I got an email from Ricardo Minetti, who at the time was like a, a project weed, I guess, you know, if you tr- extrapolate in a corporate sense or an editor, you know, head editor for Los Garabeo asking or telling me that he got my name from someone, I didn't know the name, and that he needed a writer to do a a booklet that is, uh, that I think it was 70,000 characters. So they don't talk in words. They talk in characters, including spaces. And so 7,000 characters mm-hmm. is about uh, 1,316 words. So, you know, most application, writing applications, Word, Apple Pages, uh, Scrivener, which is my preferred writing app, will do both of those conversions. So you kind of have an idea of what your target's at. But in any case, he told me he had the stack, needed it in kind of a week-long turnaround, and I enthusiastically said, yeah, let's do this. And so sometimes, so that's how I got into it. Now, it's, it's, it also has different levels. If you're lucky, especially like I was for this first time, I was able to see all the images, including the card back. So my process for all of this, and again, I, I will probably answer some of this at, um, in the Masters of Tarot, my process is to give a day or a couple hours, depending on what I have to do in a turnaround. I mean, I've written two booklets where it was, you know, literally less than a day from the due date. So I try and give some time where all I do is I look at all the images or all the content that I'm given. And I kind of put it into my intuitive portion in my brain. And I let it kind of mull that over and create that world. Like, what voice do you want? Are you going to be a fantasy? Are you going to be this? And then when I'm finally developed, you know, getting that bond, I'll sit down in front of my computer and I'll start doing, I always start with the card meanings just because that's the bulk of the writing. And sometimes it's hard, you know, you're, you're writing between uh, 300 words on up to maybe 1,000, depending on what the, the um, number of words or characters you have. And sometimes it gets repetitive. And I try to, you know, I make it a little bit harder on me because there are times where I try not to use the same word. Like, because that's what happens as you're a writer, you start falling into ruts, you know, like, oh, I'm using divination too much. I need to change divination to something else. Or, I, you know, mysterious is too much. But with that first deck, I just, I kind of wrote a story, like a description to kind of encapsulate what was going on the card a la kind of Mary Kay Greer, one of the first things she'll teach you just about anywhere is, you know, describe what or, you know, say something of what you see. Tell the story in the card. And then you come up with keywords. And I let the images tell me what the keywords are. Because not all, you know, all tarot decks, they have, many of them have different images. It might be a Rider Wait Smith clone which looks yeah. like exactly like an RWS except maybe computer graphics or, you know, watercolors. But because of that technique, it still gives you a different vibe. So I'm always trying to find the right vibe and the right words to, you know, help new beginners into that. And then I continue, you know, that on for 77 
uh, 79 cards, depending, you know, like some people put in those, you know, extra cards. And mm -hmm. so I got asked, and then I guess they liked me enough, and they kept, you know, offering me writing um, proposals until, I think, God, I think it was the second or the third year, Ricardo came back to me and said, okay, now you've got a, a bunch of this. We would like you to do a deck. And I'm like, wait, what, what? And they said, well, we have this deck called the Triple Goddess Tarot. And I went, okay. And they're like, we want you to work with Franco Ravelli, who's really good at yeah. taking art direction and stuff, and his grasp of English is good. And we want you to work with him to create a Triple Goddess Tarot. They didn't give me any um, other direction other than that's the deck name. And for me, it took <laughs> it, it, I felt like I was being tossed into the deep end of the pool because I didn't know, I've, I've never done this. I've been a tech writer. I've, I've written for uh, Wet Wolf Game Studio, so I've done gaming writing. But here I am going, I have this whole world to myself. What do I do? And Lilith is my matron. So I basically asked her one day, and I'm like, can you go talk to the ladies? And I kept it that generic because there are multiple triple goddesses, you know, vibes around the world. And I didn't want to shoehorn it into, because I'm an eclectic witch, and I didn't want to shoehorn it into a particular culture or religious structure that I wasn't, you know, that, that would have been more appropriative rather than um, appreciative. So I said, go talk to the yeah. ladies. Ask them what they want in a deck that's based around their idea. And uh, I kept waiting. I kept waiting. Ricardo got really nervous. And then, like, <laughs> five months into this, they came back with a story. And I remember getting up at night and grabbing some slips of paper and just writing out the major arcana story. And that is what, um, like, the images, like, where the light was coming from, what their story was. And from there, I was able to start working with Franco and having him bring my, my weird ideas. And I even made a Pinterest board of kind of like the modern urban fantasy stuff that I wanted into this deck to be present. And the rest was history, you know. So that's, that's one way you can get into writing, the writing for booklets biz is, you know, yeah. maybe approach the companies and say, hi, I'm a writer. I mean, that's, that's me. Jamie is a writer. I do great stick figures. And I also do great computer collage, not AI, but, you know, I can pull pieces together and make something pretty. But, right. the, you know, the other way is, like, um, when I was talking to Barbara Moore a couple of years ago, because I wanted to understand the Lowen's process, because people do come and ask me these creative questions. And I'm more than happy to help, you know, um, demystify the process. So with Los Carabello, they, they, you know, they get the artist's, in with their ideas, and in some cases the entire deck, and then they pair them up with an author. In Llewellyn, they accept a proposal from the author or the design, um, I'm going to call it the deck designer. So if I have an idea, let's say it's um, Outer Space Cats, and I write a proposal for them about this deck, and I do it in such a way that they're like, this is going to be a big seller. Remember, you know, it's not just the creative bullpen that you're going to, you know, talk to about this deck. You're going to, you know, have some number crunching. So the number people do their thing. They give me the green light. I write basically the booklet and do all the art direction. I maybe do a paragraph of what each card image it will be. But in that proposal, um, you write up three cards. They start shopping for artists. So sometimes you might be able to have a say on saying, like, I want Elizabeth Alba to do this, or I want, um, oh, I can't think of any of their other artists because they're all coming into my head, but I want this artist to kind of do it. They may not, that artist that you like may not have the time. So they shop it to a bunch of different artists, find out whether or not, see what the artist kind of can come up with real quick, and then see if they have space in their busy schedules to do something like this. So they'll partner you up, and you'll be working with that um, artist slash author. So you can still be the, you know, all-in-one package. It's just, you know, it, it varies depending on who you're going with. And I know that Wiser has a different um, process, and I'm pretty sure that Red Feather, Mind, Body, Spirit also has their own process. Like from what I understand from them, they um, their artists are the authors. So it 
red feather, you have to kind of do both unless you specify I need to bring in like Jamie or somebody as, you know, the, the book writer because I don't write. That's fast to me because I always thought, and mistakenly so obviously, but I always thought that the person creating the deck is also creating the book and that's not necessarily true. Um, yeah. And I just I, I find that fascinating, just saying. Do you it, get credit the in the deck? Is, um, yeah, well, some of them I've got my name on them, like the Heaven and Earth Tarot that I did with Jack Sephiroth, and it's won a couple of Cardo Awards. Um, I was credited in the book as well as it's on the box. In some cases, if it's a minor project, like I did do the book lit writing for Luis Garabea's uh, Panda Tarot, and uh, my name's not on that. But I have, I have like, the, the documentation and stuff to prove that that was me, I think it right. depends on how popular it is or, you know, again, the marketing type stuff and how they want to do that. But it's it's the business of magic or even the business of writing is a really interesting beast out there. And, you know, if you want to do some of this work, get comfortable, you know, talking about, you know, the numbers or, you know, how processes are done. And even, you know, if you get declined for a book or a deck by a publishing house, you know, don't think of it as you're done. Either submit it to a different publishing house or retool it to something that maybe they might want because that no might just be no, no we can't do this right now or no, we can't do it as written. But you know, sometimes if you get like the handwritten things or an email back saying tweak this and this and then we'll say yes, then, you know, you, you can start that actual process of, oh, my God, I, I'm in an actual traditional publishing house. What am I going to do other than running around and screaming I did it, which is kind of what I did <laughs> when I got in with Llewellyn. That was, that was so cool. That was one of my favorite days. I'm sure. I find writing so intimidating. I, I, that's why whenever I get to talk to an author uh, or creator, I'm like, oh, I'm going on. I'm, I'm fangirling all over the place because I think it would be, I, I find it difficult. I don't think everyone can write. I don't think everyone has the same level of talent. I don't think um, just because you want it, it'll necessarily happen. I, you know what I'm saying? I, I believe yeah. that some people have the talent. I believe that some people do not. Um, I have seen, I would say in the past uh, 13 years that I've been doing this show almost, that I've seen my fair share of decks. Um, they're not all great, uh, in my opinion, personal opinion. But you'll never hear me talk mm -hmm. about those because I don't have those decks on. Um but I, I do, and, and first I have this thing about saying anyone can do this, and it's like, no, <laughs> anyone cannot, because if anyone could, anyone would, and sometimes they mm -hmm. shouldn't. <laughs> so they don't. So I wanted to no. <laughs> or they don't. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, don't you ever, have you ever turned down work because you were just not feeling what you were being presented with? Yes. Um, I've turned down work, um, I've turned down two different projects. I've turned down I, a I Ching Oracle, um, not because I don't love it, because I Ching is my second love. However, I don't know that system well enough, as in I still have like Benabelle's book and other books that I go to to look things up. Mm -hmm. So I would be, it wouldn't be the same as understanding what's going on and being able to write for that. Um, I've also turned down, I, I have done, uh, I did the Thelama, um, T-H-E-L-A-M-A, -A, Letter Mond by Renata Lechner, and it's not the uh, Thelama religion, it's completely different, it's a world she created. Um, I did that Letter Mond, but I turned down another Letter Mond just because um, while doing the one was good, I I don't focus on Letter Mon, and I wasn't sure if I could do justice to the secondary one mm. because it, um, it, it was the Egyptian, it was the um, Art Nouveau Egyptian Letter Mon. I, I did the tarot deck for that, and that one was the most interesting one I wrote for because I didn't see any of the pictures. I got maybe one or two samples, 
And I started writing the, the text like a normal booklet, and I said, this isn't working because I don't have those images. Right. And so I had done like maybe five hours of work on this trying, because sometimes you have to, you know, get those creative juices flowing. And then sometimes yeah. you have to step away and go, this sucks, this is shit, I hate this. I'm going to go take a shower and I'm going to think about this. And in the shower, I came up with a brilliant idea of writing devotionals based off of what I know of the tarot card themes. I knew that um, in the majors of that deck, there were going to be gods, and I knew kind of which gods were going to which majors. So that helped me do something that um, I'd never done before, which was write all these devotions for each god based off of what I knew of them and what they did, and then used um, kind of you know, minor arcana is um, like, you know, dumbed down versions of like the minors to, you know, give people a way into the card without having seen the card and then adding, you know, what I thought may have been good keywords for each of those. So there there are times where you're asked to do stuff like that. And I that was the one project I have, I've done. It was crazy because, like I said, I didn't know what the cards t- turned out. I was teaching a class on fiction writing, and one of the students had that deck. And I'm like, okay, during the break, I want to see this because I wrote that book, and I have <laughs> never seen this deck. And so I got to look at the cards up close, and it was pretty cool just being able to, you know, tell those folks what I had done. So, yeah, I mean, you know, sometimes you turn down projects because – you're you're not a good fit for it or it's in a style you don't like or sometimes you pick it up because it's a style you don't like and you're like, you know, what can I do different for this? How can I beef this up? How can I make this more fun? Like the panda tarot, I got, I I didn't get an angle. You know, Ricardo was like, it's a deck with pandas. And so I kind of, in in, in my mind, I made this whole head cannon and there's this post on my website about it where pandas are the actual originators of tarot because Pandas chew bamboo. Bamboo was used to make for the first paper. So, you know, the the indigenous Chinese would run around find these pieces of like half chewed bamboo on the ground with panda paw prints on it that was kind of sticking together like paper. And then from there, they created a divination system. And so, technically, you know, pandas created tarot. I think that's so yeah. cool that you're able to just create that whole world. But I tell you, I would be terrified if I had to write about something that I couldn't physically see. I don't know I if was I could nervous. do that. Well, I mean, again, that's you know, crazy. I didn't know if I had it in me or not. I mean, I remember watching an interview. Um, I can't remember who was interviewing Barbara Moore, but she did the Diablo writing. And Diablo is a intellectual property that is well-known in gamer um, sphere of the Diablo video game series. They just came out last year with Diablo 4. And I've played 3, I've played 2. And But Barb was talking about how they um, they contacted her and that she, um, you know, hired her to write it, but she, and she got little snippets of the world, but she didn't actually see any of the cards. And so that inspired me to try, you know, if I ever had an opportunity to write a deck that didn't have any, you know, that I wasn't able to see images. And it is scary. It is terrifying. Yeah. How much does your, how much does your intuition slash wisdom of the gods or whatever your deities are, if you have any, Mm -hmm. um, how much reaching out in, in a spiritual direction do you do or do you need to do when you're writing something that you, that you can't see? Is it that you build these images in your brain for what you think it would look like, or are you just really just reaching out to spirit? How does that happen for you? I think it's a little bit of both, depending on the project. Sometimes, like I said, I'll try and work with the images themselves if I'm able to get the images. Um, when I get a full deck, right. I'm like, okay, guys, what's the world? What's your voice? And like I said, like sometimes I'm, I'm given like a couple of months, even though I know, you know, Los Garabeo always wants, you know, faster. But, you know, there yeah. may be a day or two where I just let those images sit in the back of my head and, you know, I plant their seed and they just start, you know, growing in my brain. And then it's like, oh, okay. Like, you know, in some cases I already know the thing. Like uh, I was told for heaven and earth to kind of do a Kabbalistic bent and, 
I, you know, dabble with Kabbalah enough where I call myself scary because, I, you know, once you truly think you know you have Kabbalah, when you try and repeat it back, uh-huh. you lose it. So I went on <laughs> rote, but I did a lot of journaling questions based off like the Sephiroth, uh, Sephirot and, you know, all the other knowledge that I had. I turned it into a deck of um, kind of a deep discovery. There was some stuff on the cards that I, I – some symbols that I didn't even know. There's like a bunch of a uh, bunch of the cards have arrows that point like left, right, up, down, sometimes both. And I wasn't, I didn't, I ignored those because I wasn't sure what Jack wanted, um, you know, for right. or no, noted those. But later on, I got the intuitive hit of because somebody wrote in on um, back when Twitter was good. Um, they asked me what those were for, and I said, oh, they could be energy patterns. You know, like. This moves down, this energy moves out, or, you know, it goes both ways, left and right, or both up and down. So, you know, there's many different ways, and sometimes I deliberately might ignore, you know, stuff because I don't know what, you know, the artist wanted, or I'm not into that portion, but it's always fun to let people come up with their own depictions of it. Like, while um, the Triple Goddess tarot was coming out, people were like, what did you mean by, like, these ten cards? And I told them the story behind each one, and they're like, okay, now we know. But it was different enough to where I was like, well, what did you think? And then they would tell me their stories, and I'm like, go with that, because I kind of think that's cool, too. So I'm always trying to Mm. find that balance between, you know, just uh, telling people, you know, what it is, or letting them uncover and discover it for themselves, because to me, that's more important to honor their intuitive hits. But when you're writing right. these booklets, you never know if this is going to be the first book for somebody. Sure. And I, you try and so, do a little bit of beginner stuff. Yeah. But, like, mm-hmm. so when you're, work, when you're working with someone, fortunately you can do that. Um, but I, I I would find it so disorienting to have to go in blind with, like, not even knowing who who created the images or seeing the images. Mm-hmm. I just I find that fascinating that you you're able to do that. That's such a that's it, such an interesting talent. It you know it works like um, Renata Lechner's uh, Thalamic uh, Thalama Tarot was the first deck I ever did. And they, she, they liked me enough, because I'm not really sure of the gender and some of the artists I work with, they liked me enough that I did their Millennium Thoth Tarot. I did, um, they have three tarots, and I did all three of those decks, plus that uh, Thalema uh, Lenormand with them, because I guess they mm-hmm. liked the way I wrote. But that's just, you know, what you do. You dive into it. You go, okay, this is what the book, or this is what the deck wants. I really hope Lou Scarbeo and, the, you know, the artists really enjoy this. And you just let it flow. I mean, I coming from a tech writing background, I've always, you know, I did this with Ricardo a lot of the time at first, where it was like, does the artist have any, um, did they tell you anything about what direction they wanted the, the um, book to go? I always asked for that, you know, is there a particular direction? Because I want to be able to honor that. Because otherwise, you sure. never know what you're, you know, if you, you know, and there was a, um, there was a project where I took it more of a Kabbalistic way because I never got feedback from the artist and the, uh, they hated what I wrote. So they went and did their own thing, which was fine. Wow. You know, I, it's just, yeah. You know, well, I mean, you, you know, you never know who you're going to please. I mean, I can't please everybody, and I do my best to honor whatever intentions I am I am given from Los Garabeo from an artist sure. if they're if they are you know chatty. But honestly, I have I have very little communication with the artists. I think there's only been excuse me three artists that I really talked to out of all the ones that I've done for Los Garabeo, uh, Franco, because I was giving him the direct images and then helping him along on things. Um, I talked to the artist for um, Tara Z to introduce myself and to kind of give um, the opinion of what, you know, what direction I want to go in. And the artist, let me see if I can find it real quick, Alejandro Colucci, who also did Tara Z, the vampire version of Tara Z. And who else? Um, 
I think, no, it was actually those two were the only two I really got to talk to. Um, I did help out uh, Matt Hughes for the Dreamscape Oracle deck for the Kickstarter. Mm-hmm. So, I, you know, I mean, sometimes you, you don't get to talk to those artists, and that's when you, you know, kind of do the hope and prayer thing of please goddess, please everybody, all the deities out there, let them like what I, you know, like the voice that I've given to their deck. Yeah, that's so cool, though. I mean, how many books do you th- how many of the booklets do you think you've written? Oh God, I um, I keep a shelf of everything I've ever done because I was told by another author that you should keep a shelf. So, uh, three, counting about twenty two, twenty three decks. That's impressive. I have to tell you, I think that's really impressive that you've got that you. much work out there. That is pretty damn, that's pretty cool. That's pretty yeah. cool. And that's um, not including that's you know, the book, the Llewellyn. Yeah. So, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I have fun no, with it. I, I mean. And which is, I think, wonderful. And I'm so glad I know somebody so talented. See, I don't think people oh. realize, well, I mean, there's a lot of work. Listen, every deck is a lot of work when someone is creating it. I know that. I have I have an ex-husband who tried to create a deck. I have friends who have tried to create decks. So I've tried to create a deck. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is a labor of love. It is not an easy, this is no easy thing. Uh, so yeah. the idea that yeah. you can create your own, the idea that you can help write booklets for others is that's pretty powerful stuff. That's, that's that's why you're a big name in our industry. It's so funny when people tell me that, you know, it's like you're a big name. And I'm like, I'm just me. I just like doing stuff. I mean, as a Leo, I, I like the, the publication carrot. So if you're going to, you know, tell me to, like, write something for the Carter Mancer magazine or, you know, I've I've been in uh, – I, I do podcasting for Card Slingers Coast to Coast. We recorded something this morning, Hillary Perry Hagerty and Melissa Sanova. You know, I, I'll I'll figure it out because it's my carrot, you know. I think it's wonderful. And we are Thank you. just about out of time. So I'm going to ask you to promote what you're doing again uh, before yeah. we go for the night. Tell people where they're going Perfect. to be able to find you. And But before you talk about Omega, because I know you're going to, mm-hmm. are you, are you, what are your plans for after that? Are you working on – what are you going to be working on after that? Or is that the thing you can't tell me? Um, well – I, I'll be able to tell you some stuff. So um, okay, the big event, um, the next big event, obviously, is Omega. Once again, um, it's the Masters of Tarot, August 9th through 11, 2024. Um, Mary Kay Greer, Nancy Antonucci, Michelle Welch, and I. And the website to find us is www.eomega.org. So that's... Um, the Omega Institute, Rhinebeck, New York. We're going to have a lot of fun. Um, Mary, um, Carrie Isaacuzzo, and Carolyn Cushing are running a Wisdom of Tarot program the week leading up to that. Any, anybody and everybody's welcome. We take, you know, beginners to intermediate to others. After Omega, I'm probably going to rest a couple of weeks, but I'm going to uh-huh. be attending the Northwest Tarot Symposium, which is September 6th through the 9th, I think. It's in the beginning of September. Let me uh-huh. get out my calendar because I didn't think that far ahead. Um, yeah, 6th, 7th, <laughs> and 8th. And that's going to be held at the Double Tree in Jansen Beach here. And I believe their website is nwtarotsymposium.com. After that... And, of course, in October, I'm probably going to do wishy stuff because I love me a good Samhain. I'm been, um, in my feed wings, I have a couple of books that I've been working on, the information I can't tell you about, but I also have a deck that I want to get produced and published through Llewellyn. So I am working on that. It's just my the beginning bits of just like any tree or any project product you know it's a little slow at first and then momentum will come 
I've been mostly putting all this energy into Omega to because it's it's a wonderful opportunity for me. So happy for you. And That's really great. Day. Thank you. Plus, you can hear me uh, bi-monthly on Card Swingers Coast to Coast, um, a podcast about all things tarot and tarot um, adjacent ideas. And I co-host that with Melissa Sanova and Hillary Perry Hagerty. And where is that? Where can you hear that? Um, Cardswingerscc.podbean.com. Cool. Very cool. So, Jamie, as always, it's a complete and total treat. Thank you so much for coming on and hanging out with me for the hour. Thank you. This was fun. Thank you for the great questions. I loved being able to answer them. Now, I, you, this has been an enlightening hour for me, i got to tell you. I really appreciate your insights. I, you taught me things I did not know. So I'm, I'm richer for the knowledge, definitely. But um, Cool. Good luck at the good luck at Omega because I don't think I'll be speaking yeah. with you necessarily before then, but we will make plans to catch back up again. Totally, and have fun at Mystic South. That's on my radar, possibly next year. I hope so because I would sure love to see you there. You bet. Thanks, Jamie. Talk to you soon. Have a yep. great one. Bye. Bye. Okay, guys, that's it for this week. I'll see you next week. Um, Again, I'll be at Mystic South July 26th through 28th. Uh, Come check it out. It's in beautiful Atlanta, Georgia at the plot. I keep screwing up the name of the hotel, but that's okay. Just check out Mystic South. There is a Facebook page. Check it out online. It's, It's a fantastic conference. Hope to see you there. Have a great weekend, y'all. Bye.